All right, Unit 7, Lecture 1. 7 out of 10 units. That's it, 4 units of material. This is the second semester calculus. The first semester we did kind of limits, we did continuity. That was kind of like the first third. Second third was differential calculus. This last third is integral calculus. Okay. Two major problems that were solved by the invention of calculus. The first problem we dealt with in the first semester. Where we asked what is the instantaneous rate of change of a function? Well, we first introduced the average rate of change of a function, which is just the change in the y over the change in the x, or the slope of the secant line. And we said if we want to find the instantaneous rate of change, well, you take those two points, you put them infinitely close together, all of a sudden you have a tangent line. And the slope of the tangent line would be the instantaneous rate of change of the function. of the tangent. Okay, this is called differential calculus. Check. Done that. Problem two is what we're going to deal with this semester. Okay, the problem is, what is the exact area under this curve? And I don't want to say it's the area under the curve. I want to say the, the area between the curve and the x-axis. Maybe I'll change that. And maybe it's from here to here, or maybe I can just, like, denote you know, a range and say, okay, what is the area denoted here? Okay, this is integral calculus. And what we will discover is that these two problems, though they seem very, very different, slopes of tangents and areas under curves, are actually related. But we're not going to see how they are related until the fourth lesson of this unit. Okay? We actually won't even be thinking much in terms of calculus as we know it until the third lesson of this unit. For this first and this second lesson of this unit, all you need to think about is geometry and areas. Okay? So wipe the slates clean right now. We're not thinking derivatives. We're not thinking slopes of tangents. We're thinking geometry and areas under curves. Okay? Areas. Length times width. So we're going to start off by looking at two different functions. And I'm going to pose the question, if you can find the area under the function and above the x-axis between 0 and 8. So I'll go ahead and sketch those two functions down. And then see if you can give me the exact area under the function. So that'd be all of this stuff. See if you can find. And then same here, all of it.
Alright, uh, guy on the left, can we find the area under the line between the x-axis um, for the guy on the left? 20, is it 20 or is it uh, 24? Yeah, 24, it goes to 6, yeah. Uh, yeah, so it's just a, it's a, a triangle, you know? This is a function, it's just a straight line, but it creates this triangle. We can find the area of a triangle, 1 half base times height. So it's 1 half, 8 times 6. Is 24. All right. What about the guy on the right? Can we find the area of the guy on the right? The exact area. Yeah, so the one on the right's a lot harder, right? We're going to eventually be able to figure it out, but as we look at it, right, what makes the one on the right harder than the one on the left? It's curves. Yeah, it's not a straight line. So it's like, ugh, not straight lines. But, you know, could we approximate the area? Could we, like, take a guess? 36? I mean, that's a good guess. How'd you guess 36? It's a little more than half. It's a little more than half, so... It's less than 64, 8 by 8? Yeah, well, what you are doing, essentially, is just using geometric figures, right, that you already know the area to. And you're going to just say, hey, you know, maybe we'll just say this looks to be about half of this you know, square here, maybe this is just a triangle. You know, that's pretty good, but maybe this hump right here is a little bit more than what you're losing there. And then we got this stuff up here. So that's okay, that's decent. But maybe we can do more than that. Maybe what we can do is create a bunch of different shapes, triangles and rectangles, it's very necessary. Don't worry. We're only going to do this today, and then it gets, uh, well, no, you'll see. They will create a bunch of different shapes, and we will then add up the areas of all those shapes, right? It's tedious, but we can do it. Tedious, but it's doable. Sure, all it is is just this area plus this area plus this area four, five, until we get to six. So, well, I don't know what the area is exactly, but I know it's approximately the sum of these A's, these areas, you can call them AI's, when I starts from your first area, in this situation, we're going to our sixth area. And that'll be a good approximation. I just take the sum of a bunch of geometric shapes that I know the areas or how to calculate the areas for, Add those together, and I have a good approximation. Okay, well, there is a guy, famous mathematician, He's actually probably more famous for the other stuff that he's known, but he's more well known for this thing that he created, uh, who kind of formulized this, this, this idea of taking geometric shapes and using these geometric shapes to uh, approximate areas under curves, okay? The guy was called Bernard Riemann, and he created a Riemann sum. And what a Riemann sum is, is just an area approximation, just like we did on the right, where we're summing a bunch of geometric shapes that we know how to calculate the areas to, only it's a little more formulaic. You know, instead of just a random shape, he says, listen, just use one specific type of shape, okay? And instead of like a random size of each shape, he say, let's make these formulaic, Let's make all of these shapes have the same width, okay? So the base of all of these shapes need to be the same. 
And he said, you know what, let's just use rectangles typically. Now we won't just use rectangles, but let's use rectangles because they're easy to work with. And let's make sure all of these rectangles have equal width. Okay, and what he did is he said, okay, let's just make sure we know how to find these equal widths. Let me just uh, delete these really quickly. And he says, let's use something called a partition. Okay? And a partition is just the width of each geometric figure. And he says, let's make this area under this curve. And let me just move this down just so we can see it all at the same time. Riemann says, you want to find the area under this curve? Let's not arbitrarily throw down random geometric shapes, but instead, let's say, okay, we want to go from 0 to 8. Let's split this into even partitions. So we have even subintervals. So say if I want to split this into eight different partitions, what would be the base length of each of my shapes if I want to split from 0 to 8 into eight partitions? Just one, exactly. I would split and I would have a geometric figure with a base of length 1 every single time. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, you get the idea. Okay? And they're all supposed to be, you know, the same length. 4, 5, 6, 7. Okay? So, and this is how you figure out the partition. This is kind of like your base length of your object. And since it's a base length, and we're talking about an x and a y axis, we'll just say, say it's a change in our x. Okay? So if you want to have eight geometric figures from 0 to 8, you go 8 minus 0 divided by 8. Each change in x is just 1. And then what we'll end up doing is we'll plop rectangles or trapezoids or um, you know other types of rectangles on top of those bases. But we'll have to do it in a very formulaic way. So there are multiple types of Riemann sums. Left, right, midpoint, and trapezoidal. Okay, and each of them are just different formulas for specific ways to approximate the area under the curve. So let's start with the left one. Now, this is the same figure as you saw above, but it'd be good if you uh, sketch it down, maybe a bigger version of it. You also include these values. These are important. And if it's nice and big, you'll be able to do all four of these sums and these graphical examples all in one. If you have like different colored pencils, it'd be a good day to do use different colored pencils or pens or whatever. Um, or you could just copy it down quickly four times just to see the difference between, you know, the the different types of uh, geometric figures that we're going to place to approximate this area. Okay, so a left Riemann sum is, of course, just an area under a curve approximation. We're going to be using rectangles specifically. So Riemann is just doing this formulaic approximation. We're going to pick a specific type of geometric figure. We're also going to keep the bases all going to be the same, so the same type of partition. And then he's going to take a specific function value to denote our height of all of our rectangles. And in this case, a left Riemann sum, the real reason why it's called a left is because that is the height 
that we're going to choose from. The height will be the left function value on our subinterval. Okay, I'll give you some time to uh, sketch the graph as well as the table of values, and we'll go from there. All right, we want to approximate the area under this curve above the x-axis between the curve and the x-axis from 0 to 8 using a left Riemann sum with four subintervals. Okay, well, knowing that we have four subintervals, that's going to give me the width of my partition, the width of the base of all of these geometric shapes. What would be the width of all of these rectangles that we're going to be placing down? Two, exactly. Okay, so the delta x, or the width of the base, or the width of your shapes, would be equal to your b minus a over the n, which is just 8 minus 0 over 4. Each of these widths has to be 2. Okay, so we can start by actually kind of writing down here and denoting the bases of my figures. This is going to be my first shape on this first base from 0 to 2. The second shape will be from 2 to 4. The third shape will be from 4 to 6. And then my last shape to approximate my area will come from 6 to 8. Okay. Now, since this is a left Riemann sum, we're going to be using rectangles whose height is determined by the function value on the left of each subinterval. So out of each of these intervals, what we will do is we'll go to the leftmost point, and we will go to the function value above that leftmost point, and that will create the height of the rectangle that will be going on this interval. Okay, so I did one. I want you guys to do the other three. So at each sub interval, we are going to be using the height, which is denoted by the function value on the leftmost point of my subinterval. So here, between 2 and 4, I use the function value over 2. That's my height. Between maybe 6 and 8, you'd be looking at the function value over 6. And that would be my height of my last rectangle.
if you guys can sketch these, you're on your way to understanding how these Riemann sums work. So between 0 and 2, I'm actually going to use this point zero 0.01 as my height because that's the leftmost function value. Between 4 and 6, I'll use this height here above 4, which is 4. Between 6 and 8, I'll use the height at 7, and that'll be the height of my last rectangle. Okay. Using a left Riemann sum, the area can be calculated. It'll be approximately the basis times the heights, just added together. So we got base times height, so 2 times 1 plus 2 times 5 plus 2 times 4 plus 2 times 7. And if you want to maybe do it a little quicker, you can factor out a 2 because the delta x, which is 2, is consistent everywhere. It will just be the base length times the sum of all of your heights. So 1 plus 5 plus 4 plus 7. This also could be seen if you used your table. You could separate the intervals using your table by kind of using your subintervals here. So 0 to 2, 2 to 4, 4 to 6, 6 to 8. And then you could say, oh, the leftmost function value 1, 5, 4, 7. Those are my heights. Okay, so 7 plus 4 is 11, plus 5 is 16, plus 1 is 17, times 2 is 34. Now, questions about that? Comments? Anything. Yeah, it doesn't seem that great, right? Does not seem very good. That's what I was looking for. Exactly. Does not seem like a great approximation. Yes, true. However, Riemann is just like it's not whether it's great right now. It's that we have a formula for it. It's that there's a systematic way to find it. What would make a better approximation? Using this type of system, though, this L Hodge. Well, let's stay with left. Let's just say I'm only going to use the heights on the left. What would make a better approximation? No, we're staying with rectangles. Mr. Lusu, what did you say? So instead of having four rectangles, what could we have to make a better approximation? Let's use more rectangles. Okay, that's exactly right. So Riemann says, well, yeah, four is probably not going to be good. He can accept that, but what if I added, you know, four more? And all of a sudden I have more rectangles. All of a sudden, I, I know you can't kind of see the difference, but <laughs> you can get my drift right here. All of a sudden, it's better. You know, it's, uh, it's going to be more of the area. We'll miss less of the area, and things are going to be a little bit better. Well, 8 going to be good, but guess what? 16 will be better. 32 will be better. And all we would need is just more function values, and we'd be able to do that, right? 
Okay? So that's the idea. The only thing Riemann says is like, we're going to be able to do that idea if we have enough function values this systematic way. Because all the widths are going to be the same. It's going to be easy to do a width and then a bunch of heights added together. Okay? So let's keep that idea in mind that the more rectangles we'd have, the better our approximation would be. But let's do the other three Riemann sums just so you're familiar with them before we get into getting these better approximations. So, right Riemann sum, same thing as the left, we're using rectangles, it's a systematic way to approximate the area using rectangles, we're going to have the same length of the base, just like the left Riemann sum, so we're going to partition out our base, only difference is we are going to be using heights determined by the right function value on our uh, subinterval. So, same picture, same table of values, same amount of subintervals, only now we're going to be using a right Riemann sum, so right heights. So, first thing I will do is partition off our subintervals 0 to 2, 2 to 4, 4 to 6, 6 to 8. And now, and I can do the same thing up here. 0 to 2, 2 to 4, 4 to 6, 6 to 8. And now on each of these intervals, as the basis of my geometric objects, I'm going to use the height based on the rightmost point of my interval as the height of my rectangle on this interval. So I'm going to say from 2 to 4, come up here to this value 4 only this height is going to be used right here. Okay, I did the first one, you guys do the other ones. Draw me the right rectangles. So from 4 to 6, I'm going to use this height above 6. From 6 to 8, I'll use this height above 8. And notice, like, this, this is different. This is going to give me a different value. This looks like it's going to be over you know, our actual area. We're going to be using this height 5, 4, 7, and 7.5. Seven and so a right Riemann sum area would be approximately, you know, it would be 2 times 5 plus 2 times 4, etc., or 2 times the sum of your height. So 5 plus 4 is 9, plus 7 is 16, plus 7 and a half is uh, 23 and a half. 23 and a half times 2 is 47. So again, it's a poor estimation of your area, but you know that if I had more of these right rectangles, it'd be better. The more rectangles I'd have, the better approximation I'd get. This would just be a different. You know, it's kind of what we see and what we'll see in the future is that this left one 
would give me kind of like a lower bound for what the actual area would be because it looks like we are well under our actual area, mostly because of this area that we're missing and here. And this would kind of be an upper bound because it looks like we have more area than the actual. So you could say the exact is probably between my left Riemann sum in this case and my right read run sum. And for most situations, if my graph is kind of being consistent in the way it's moving, these left and right Riemann sums will give me kind of bounds for what my exact area could be. Okay? So, cool. Two more. Midpoint and trapezoidal. Midpoint is the same as left and the right, only you're going to be using the height determined by the function value on the middle of the interval. So I'll do it in green. Same four subintervals, mostly just to make it quick. Two to two, two to four, four to six, six to eight would be the basis of all these rectangles. The only difference now is instead of using the height determined by the left or the height of my rectangle determined by the right, it's going to be the height determined by the point in the middle. So for this first one between 0 and 2, I'm going to use the height of 4, the height above the middle point of my interval. What would that look like? Yes. Okay, so sketch those and then find the area approximation. So midpoint Riemann sum area would be approximately base 2 times height 4 plus base 2 times height 4.5, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Or you could factor out the two and just do the sum of your heights. So 9 plus 2. Uh, sorry, 9 plus 4 is 13. 13 plus 8. Uh, is 21. 21 times 2 is 42. Okay. Now, is that the better approximation than the left or the right? You know, we don't want to say that they're better or worse. We'll say they're equally as bad. Why? Because we don't have that many rectangles. We don't have that many subintervals. So we can't say that one's better the, than the other. They all could be great if they all just had more and more rectangles used, okay? Last one is the trapezoid. This is the one that's going to look like it's the best. But again, they're all really the same. It's all about the amount. Let's first remind ourselves of trapezoids and how to calculate the area of a trapezoid. Typically, a trapezoid has a base 1 and a base 2 and a denoted height. Area of a trapezoid is 1 half the height times the sum of your bases. Okay. 
Well, let me show you how the trapezoids are going to appear uh, on these Riemann sums when we're approximating areas. So here we want, and I kind of explained it here, the height is going to be represented by the width, but the bases are going to be like the heights of the function values. It's kind of confusing. It's good to draw the picture of this trapezoid and then the picture of the next trapezoid I'm going to show you. Okay? So we're going to use eight subintervals in this situation. So automatically eight is better than four. We'll have a good approximation using eight. So I'll go zero to one, one to two, two to three, three to four, four to five, five to six, six to seven, seven to eight. Here's how the trapezoids look. You will have both function values will be kind of reached above your endpoints of your intervals. And all we do is we connect them using a diagonal line. So it's almost like a triangle on top of a rectangle. I'll show you another one like this one. Both heights kind of represented and then connected. Okay, it's a triangle on top of a rectangle. Well, that's actually a trapezoid. Here's what happens is that the trapezoid ends up getting stood on its end like this. Uh, and this base ends up becoming a height kind of deal. This base ends up becoming another height. And what the height ends up becoming is your width of your interval, your delta x. Do we all see how these trapezoids have kind of turned onto its edge and flattened out? <coughs> Excuse me. Okay, well, I can kind of create all of these trapezoids and then sum up all their areas. They're definitely the easiest to draw and least likely to get tripped up on because you're using every single value, whereas in the left or the right or the midpoint, you're only using some values. Okay, let me show you how we'll have to calculate this because this might take a while. We might need a calculator uh, to do it. We're going to have to sum up all of these Trapezoids. Well, let's look at our first trapezoid at least, right here. This is a height. This is a height. Those are actually our two bases. And this delta x, that's the height of our trapezoid. So who can give me the formula for the area of that trapezoid? Yeah, it'd be one half times the height, which is one, times the sum of one plus four. Exactly. So this is a trapezoidal Riemann sum. Area is approximately, well, we can start by going one half times the width of one, which is our height, times the basis. And then we'll have one half. The next base, so this is 4, the next one is 5. And then the third one would have one base, which is 5, and then the next base is 4.5. This is 1 half times 1, really. And we can continue this all the way until we get to the last one. That's 8 plus 7.5. Okay, it's a lot of calculations, but there's a shortcut. I'll show you. If I wrote this as 1 half delta x, f1 plus f2, 1 half delta x, 
This is the F2 plus F3. One half delta X, F3 plus F4, all the way to the end, I'd have one half delta X, F7, F8. Let me write that again. Similar to how we can simplify our rectangle kind of formulas, I can simplify this as well. What do each of these sums have in common? It's got a number from before, and it's got a one-half and a delta x that they share in common, right? So watch. I can factor out a one-half delta x from each of these, and all of a sudden I got f1 plus f2 plus f2 plus f3 plus f3 plus f4, and then that would always continue to F7 plus F8. Well, notice what we have. We have two of these F2s that we're adding, and two of these F3s. We'd have two F4s, F5, F7, and we'd have one F1 and one F8. So that brings us to our shortcut to find a big trapezoidal sum. It would be one half our width which ends up being our height times our first height plus our last height plus twice the sum of our middle. So that's first plus last plus double the middle. So in this specific example, we have one half, the widths are all one, my first number is one, my last number is 7.5, plus double my middle numbers, four plus five plus 4.5 plus four plus 4.5 plus seven plus eight which is, you know, still a nasty calculation to do in your head, but at least in your calculator, we are eliminating a lot of stuff we have to type in, okay? And on your homework, you're going to use this. It'll be easy. So, did anybody do that? Yeah, 42.75 or something like that? Yeah. Cool. I think that's what they got last. Oh, 41.25 is what they got. Maybe I forgot a number or two in the last class. Who knows? That looks good. 4, 5, 4.5, 4, 4.5, 4, 4, 4, 4, 4, 8. Okay, good. All right. Well, all of those can be thought of as the same. The trapezoidal looked great, but really the reason why it was so nice is because we used eight of those subintervals instead of the left and the right and the midpoint where we used four. But if we wanted a more exact approximation for the area under the curve using a Riemann sum, everybody should know the answer to this. What should we do? Yeah, we actually want more rectangles, right? Well, how many more do we want? Well, I mean, let's see. If I had like eight, that's good, sure. These are just quick. Well, if I had 16, that's better, right? Well, if I had 32, those would be better. I'd be uh, the better approximation using like these trapezoids. Well, 64 would be better. Really, I just want as many slices as possible. And eventually, if I slice it 
as many times as possible, pretty much I will have the exact value. I'll have the exact area. I'll get closer and closer to the exact area in, until it just doesn't change anymore and I have the exact area. Okay, so here's what we were doing. We were taking the sum, okay, of a bunch of heights times a bunch of widths, right? These are rectangles. A left Riemann sum. And let's say we started with, you know, my first height, f of x i, when i is 1, so that's my first height, and we went to the nth height. You know, maybe we went to 8. And of course, this delta x is wherever my b minus a over n ends up being, so b would be like this, a would be like this, okay? And that's what we were doing. We just took sums of areas of rectangles. Well, to get the exact area, the best thing we could do is take this sum and instead of eight rectangles or even 16 rectangles, how many rectangles do I kind of want? An infinite amount of rectangles. Well, we're not going to say n equals infinity because that's not really possible to do. We can say it, but we're going to use different notations. We're going to put something before this to denote that n is going to be equal to infinity. We'll use a limit notation. We'll say, hey, take the limit as n approaches infinity of this sum of these rectangles. Now, what happens to delta x? as n approaches infinity. Exactly, as n gets really, really big, b minus a over n approaches zero. We will have rectangles that are infinitely skinny. Well, since that approaches zero, can we say the area is equal to zero? No, because it still has some value. That's the beautiful thing about a limit. You know, when we were talking about the limit as h approaches zero, we never said that, like, the two points to create a tangent line were on top of each other. They were just really, really close to each other. Right, Mr. Barron? It's right. So even though we say that these widths of these rectangles are essentially zero, they still have some value, and they're not, like, infinitely many rectangles with zero width. They have some value, okay? So this is approaching zero. Well, whenever we took, you know, delta y over delta x as my average rate of change, and I turned it into instantaneous rate of change, and this delta y ended up being, like, really, really close to each other, what was the notation we used instead of change in y or delta x? What was the notation we used for a derivative, which was the instantaneous rate of change? We used dy over dx, right? This is the change in y over change in x of two points infinitely close together. Well, if this is approaching zero, we could say this is like an instantaneous change on the x-axis. And what people did is they said, listen, I don't want to write this out every single time. This takes a long time to write out. I get sick of it. Okay? Just like they got sick of taking derivatives using the long way, using the definition of a derivative. So they used different notation. They said, don't write the limit as n approaches infinity of the sum from 1 to n. Instead, use this long, tall, skinny s. And that is the same as this. And that stands for an infinite sum. Just like this stands for an infinite sum. It's an infinite sum of all of these function values, which represent heights, times the width, to make rectangles. And we're going to start at A and go to B, which kind of shows you 
you know, how many partitions or where the partitions start and end at. This is an integral. This is an integral notation. Let me copy this, take it to the next page. This is the notation for the exact area under a curve. What started as this turns into something simple. That's this. No, dx is an infinitely skinny width, right? Just like dy over dx is like an infinitely small change in y over an infinitely small change in x. That is slope of a tangent, right? dx used in this case is an infinitely skinny width of a rectangle. However, of course, if we take infinitely skinny rectangles, add them together, we will essentially have the exact area under this curve. Okay, this is called an integral. An integral is just an infinite sum. The sum of infinitely many things. This is the integral from A to B of f of x dx. Okay, and it stands for the sum of, I did this for a reason. There we go. Sum of the infinitely many rectangles with length dx and height f of x between a and b. Okay, so what is that notation? It's just area, essentially. It's a cumulated sum. It's a sum of infinitely things, which really represents, you know, the sum of these rectangles, which can be thought of as area. You guys can kind of answer questions using this notation already. You already really did one on that first kind of example I showed you when I asked you to find the area under the curve. Well, I could ask you a similar type of question only using this notation. So, let's not pa are we done at 26 or are we done at 36? Well, we'll get through these three. All right. Let's get through these three. There'll be one more thing that you'll have to watch about over approximations and under approximations. So, Mr. Barron, here's your first question. What is the integral from 0 to 3 of f of x dx? Or what is the infinite sum of skinny rectangles with height f of x with dx from 0 to 3 if this is f of x? Yeah, it looks really complicated, right? Six is the right answer. Do you see why, Mr. Barron? It's just the area from zero to three under f of x. It's a rectangle. You can do that. All right, Mr. Barron, take number two. Welcome to third period A day. All right, from zero to three of gx dx. That's g of x. You're gonna have to go three. Good call. Good call. All right, and that's because this is a straight line. I can find the infinite sum of infinitely skinny rectangles. This is the area using geometry. Something like this. What do we got? Sure. Four. Four. Let's see. We're going to go actually from negative three to negative one. So it's a one and a two. So that's three. The width is two. Uh, so one half, two. That's actually three. Exactly. Okay. Now, what if the curve went under the x axis? Now, don't worry. Just watch the rest of this online, okay? All right, what if our curve went under the x-axis? Well, yes, this means area, but it really goes back to this notation. It's an infinite sum, and it's an infinite sum of a bunch of heights times a bunch of width. So if you think about the area from 0 to 2, 
down here. Well, let's go back to kind of thinking about rectangles with heights and widths. Well, if I think about the heights being represented by the function values. These heights of these rectangles right here are all actually negative function values. Since we have negative function values and the widths that are positive, these widths going from 0 to 2, you know, we would consider this height to be, you know, negative 3, and the sum of all of these negative heights times these widths would really be just, you know, a negative area of negative 3. Because these heights are negative and these widths are remaining positive. So this is just interesting. We can have what we can almost consider a negative area. Um, if it's under the x-axis. You know, it's almost safe to just think of it that way so that you don't get too confused. If the you know, area is underneath the x-axis, then uh, or if your line's underneath the x-axis, you consider your area negative. Now, if I went from, say, negative 1 to 2, this is interesting as well. We'd have this negative area, negative 3, but we'd also have this positive area, of 0.5, which would be combined, and this would be like subtracted from the negative 3 or added to the negative 3 to be negative 2.5. Okay? So, interesting. And we could go into a question, and you'll see lots of uh, graphs like this on the AP exam, and lots of questions where you'll just be given straight lines, and you'll be asked these questions, you know, what is the infinite sum from 0 to 2 of a bunch of function heights uh, times the width? And you can just think of this as being, okay, what is the area from 0 to 2 underneath this function and above this x-axis, or between the function and the x-axis? And we can do that. This is a base of 2, height of 1, height of 2, so that's 1 half. The base would be considered the height of your trapezoid. And then your widths are 1 and 2. So this is 1, this is 3, so this is 3. And then from 2 to 4, base of 2, height of 2, this would be 4. So the area would from 0 to 5 would be 7. From 0 to 7, you'd have this 3, this 4. This is a base 1, height 2 triangle. So that's just 1. This is a base 2, height 2. So that's negative 2, you can consider. So throw them all together, 7, 8, 7, 6. Okay? So that's uh, areas using this integral this notation, this infinite sum notation. Um, now, when we go to curves, again, we still are not able to find you know, the exact area right now, right now, but we still think of approximations. Well, and using these Riemann sums. And if we had more, of course, it'd be better approximations. Well, let's talk about over and under approximations because, you know, what would be a good thing is if we understand our Riemann sums, where they come from, and understand if they're over or under our actual value, we'd have a better idea of what the actual value could be. And we talked about that a little bit before. So let's take this piece of function. It's increasing. Uh, this is concave up. Um, it doesn't have to be as long as it's increasing everywhere. It could be, you know, concave down and up like that. But let's just assume it's just concave up. And the question is, would a left Riemann sum yield an over or under approximation for the exact area under the curve from A to B? Well, let's think about it. A left Riemann sum would it be over or under the exact area. The way I like to do this is to kind of partition off a couple of rectangles. You know, maybe two, maybe you just use one, maybe you use four, whatever. And you say, okay, let's have two rectangles with this as the base and then this as the base. I'll use this as the height for my first rectangle since it's a left Riemann sum. And this would be the height of my second rectangle since it's a left Riemann sum. I notice that this area in these two Riemann sum rectangles is less then my overall area, which also includes this and this. So this would be an under. Okay? Now what if I asked you the same question? 
um, only we're now decreasing and we're talking about a right read month sum. Is a right read month sum over or under? Well, same deal. Split it up, maybe make two rectangles. Here's my first one's base, here's the second one. Here is the height, and here is this height. Well, same deal, this would be also under. Okay, but if I switched up the question and if this is like, well, let's maybe do one more question. Given a function with uh, f of x is bigger than zero and f prime of x is less than zero, is a left Riemann sum an over or under approximation? Well, sketch this curve. My function values are positive, but since the derivatives are less than zero, my function is decreasing. I don't care how I draw it decreasing function. I do a left three month sum. So let's say I take two rectangles from here to here and here to here. I would take the function value on the left of my interval as the height of my rectangle. Function value on the left of this interval would be the height of this rectangle. This area would be over the actual exact area of my uh, under my curve. So this would be a over approximation, um, which means exact is a little bit under. What you'll find in certain questions is that, you know, we'll go back to this statement that if we know that this right Riemann sum is over and the left Riemann sum was probably under, we know the exact is between 32 and 47. You'll see a couple AP questions will they'll give you the answer 32 and they'll give you the answer 47 and they'll ask you for the exact area and you'll have to just pick out the number that's between say like 41 and you'll circle that as like well that could be the exact area under the curve. Okay so keep that in mind uh, while you're working on your homework and uh, for your quizzes moving forward. Thanks.